Welcome, everyone. Um, very, very excited uh, about today's event and such a wonderful way um, to start the spring semester and uh, really continue uh, our strong commitment in uh, sort of supporting um, BIPOC architects and, you know, in the past and, and in the future. And I'm particularly grateful for Mary McLeod um, to have organized this wonderful uh, event, uh, New Research in Black Women's History and Architecture. Also wanted to take a moment to uh, welcome back uh, two alumni from the school who are just um, kind of wonderful to have you back, Robert, Roberta Washington and Patricia Morton. And um, just eager to learn more about uh, Norma Merrick's cleric and Beverly Green and, and uh, learn more about all the work uh, Mary and Victoria have been doing uh, on kind of exposing and uh, pioneering women uh, in architecture um, throughout history. So welcome everyone and uh, Mary, thank you again. Thank you, Amal. Um, and thank you, Lila Cartillier for encouraging us to do this event. Um, I, I'm so grateful to Amal. The moment I suggested that Norma Scalaric appeared on the website, she was she said, let's do something. So it's great to have that kind of support. Um, we also hope not only that you'll learn about these two fascinating women we're, we'll be speaking, um, Pat and Roberta will be speaking about, but that will, it will inspire further research um, on both on black women architects, on black architects and women architects in general. Um, I also want to thank BWAF, Beverly Willis Architecture Foundation, for sponsoring the website that Victoria Rosner and I have been co-editing and in, on which uh, uh, Pat and Roberta have uh, been fundamental, um, to which they've been fundamental and wrote not only the profiles that they'll be discussing today, one is posted, one is coming up soon, uh, but the, they've also written each another profile on an early pioneering woman architect. Um, briefly outline the structure of the program after introducing the speakers, Victoria will provide an introduction to the website and some context about the research. Um, Roberta Washington, um, who graduated from Columbia in 71, We'll speak about Beverly Lorraine Green, and then Patricia Morton, I think she finished in 83. Uh, we'll speak about Norma Merrick Scalaric, and then we'll follow by a questions and answers and hopefully a larger discussion, which um, I'll try to launch off with some broad questions. And then we really hope the audience will participate as well as the panelists and Victoria. Um, I already mentioned one of the footnotes, the link to Columbia, both of the two women and the speakers. Um, I think I have to check this. Green uh, finished her degree in 1945 and Scholaric 1950. Um, so these really were pioneers. And I also want to mention something very nice that's happening at GSAP, that the research uh, that we'll be discussing today coincides with the launch of the Norma Merrick Scholaric Scholarship Fund, which we hope will increase diversity, equity at the school. Um, and for those of you who have deep pockets, I hope you'll contribute to it. Um, anyway, uh, that's the sort of beginning structure. Um, start off with introducing the three speakers, including my co-editor of the website, Victoria Rosner, and someone I'm actually fortunate to be co-teaching with this semester. Uh, Victoria is what you might call a Columbia lifer. Um, she went to Columbia College. She got her doctorate in English. Um, and I was lucky to meet her first when she asked me to participate on her doctoral uh, committee, a kind of a shock, what am I doing on an English dissertation? But she's been one of those really innovative scholars doing interdisciplinary work on the intersections between literature and architecture. Um, and her dissertation led to her first prize-winning book, Modernism and Architecture of Private Life, published in 2005. Uh, currently, Victoria is Dean of Academic Affairs at Columbia. 
uh, and teaches in the English and Comparative Literature uh, Department. Besides co-editing Pioneering Women, she's also co-edited and edited other volumes, the Cambridge Companion to the Bloomsbury Group uh, in 2015, and a book titled The Global and the Intimate Feminism in Our Time uh, the year earlier. Um, she just published a wonderful new book. I'm gonna show it to you, uh, Machines for a Living. Oh. I'm not very good at this with the, um, the web, uh, which came out uh, this year, uh, Oxford University Press. And one other thing I'd like to mention, uh, she's the founder and co-director of a working group at Columbia for the Center for the Study of Social Difference on the front line, nursing in the pandemic, started in 2018, um, a response to Ebola, and now all the more relevant with COVID. Okay, the next, um, I think that was my laundry machine telling me there's other parts of life. Um, okay, the next speaker is Patricia Morton. Uh, no, I got that in the wrong order, sorry. Our next speaker is Roberta Washington, um, whom I'm delighted to introduce. I first got to know her through VWAF and working on the website with her, with her on her profiles. Um, I encourage you, and I think Victoria will show it, to look at one of her other profiles, Georgia Louise Harris Brown. Um, uh, it's an amazing feat of scholarship. And if you knew the backstories of how she worked out the personal life of this fascinating figure, I think you'd be in awe of her as I am. She got her Bachelor of um, BA from Howard, her MS in architecture in that old but very relevant program, Hospital and Health from Columbia, part of the um, architecture school at the time, and was in that amazing group of 25 Black students who came to the school after the events of 68. And I think a kind of invitation for all of us to rethink that moment. Uh, she appears in Sharon Sutton's book, When the Ivies Were Black. She then worked in Mozambique from 77 to 81, uh, started her own firm in 1983, and has been practicing in Harlem, right near us all. Um, an amazing practice that does new and rehabilitation work in housing, education, medical facilities, and also preservation. Um, I encourage all of you to look at her Barnard Environment Magnet School in New Haven, uh, which is um, actually represents with the title, uh, one of the most environmentally friendly buildings um, of recent times and won award for that. Um, she also, uh, just to mention a few other projects, I can't exhaust them, uh, did preservation on Astor Row in Harlem, Jazz and Negro Baseball Museum in Kansas City uh, and built um, the African Burial Ground Center. She became a fellow in the AIA uh, in 2006 and has had huge leadership roles, past president of the National Organization of Minority Architects, NOMA, um, was on the New York Landscape Commission and Central Harlem Community Board. Um, She's been working for years on Black architects in New York State and contributed to Drex Spurlock's Biographical Dictionary of African American Architects, 1865 to 1945. Um, now to turn to Pat, whom I've known since she was a student. Am I allowed to admit that? Uh, she studied at Yale as an undergraduate, got her MARC at Columbia, and then received her doctorate at Princeton. Um, she's now teaching a uh, tenured professor at University of California, Riverside, um, where she's in the media and cultural studies department, another interdisciplinary sort, and also chair of urban studies. Um, she wrote a groundbreaking book, uh, uh, Hybrid Modernities, on the 1931 uh, World's Fair, um, which believe me was uh, important to my own work on the 30s. And I learned a lot from Pat. 
She's written extensively on race, gender, and identity um, for the website. Besides writing about Scholaric, she wrote about an even earlier Columbia graduate, who has a long name, Verna Cook Salomonsky Shipway. Um, and uh, again, I alert you to look at that uh, work. Um, she's currently working on a project called Paying for Public Life on Charles Moore. And I would like to alert you all to a forthcoming article on Moore's uh, Church Street South Public Housing Project which deals with issues of public life, race, and urban renewal. Um, she's an institutional leader. I, I am sort of struck by how both Roberta and, and Pat are so engaged uh, in organizational leadership. She's the former editor of the Journal of Society of Architectural Historians, now is the first VP of SAH, where she's worked hard to diversify the organization. Um, and she also mentions on her own CV uh, that she's part of, I'm not going to give the right title, the Tenants Union um, in LA, uh, where she co-authored an article, Affordab Affordable Housing is a Scam. So thank you all for participating. And I'll turn it over now to Victoria. Thank you, Mary. Thank you for that enormously generous introduction. I, I have to start by saying what I think is probably true for many of us here today, which is that Mary has been a beacon to me my entire career. And I am so honored to have been had the chance to work on pioneering women of American architecture with her and to be teaching with her this semester. Full disclosure, my current book is dedicated to her. So uh, there you have it. Um, and it's also a great pleasure for me to be speaking, at least metaphorically, uh, at GSAP um, since, you know, from the time that I was a graduate student in English and I wandered into Avery Library and, and hoped to make my way. Uh, it's just been a, a source of great um, delight and inspiration for me. So I'm just going to talk quickly. The main attraction here, obviously, uh, are hearing about these two fascinating architects. Um, I'm just going to set up a little bit of context by talking about the larger archival project that has produced um, the research that you'll hear about today. I also want to quickly surface some of the methodological commitments uh, of the project, which I hope perhaps we'll return to during the question period. Um, so uh, as Mary started to say, the research you'll hear about today was undertaken under the auspices of the Beverly Willis Architecture Foundation, uh, born 20 years ago when its architect founder realized that work by women was barely mentioned in architectural history. Uh, this discovery likely will not come as a surprise to any of you, but it was a shock at the time to Beverly Willis. Um, an important part of the foundation's work is this project um, that you'll be hearing about, Pioneering Women of American Architecture, a web-based archive launched with the support of the National Endowment for the Arts. Uh, the project offers a way of, we hope, of writing women back into US architectural history. Its initial ambition was to support the creation of in-depth profiles of 50 women architects born before 1940, all written by scholars and based on original primary research. Uh, the work we think, we hope, offers both a needed correction to the historical record and a way to redress the significant documented disparities between men and women in the architecture profession, uh, disparities that have persisted even as women's enrollment in architecture degree programs has increased. These disparities are especially extreme for black women. If you don't know these numbers already, they will stun you. Um, according to the most recent figures from the National Council of Architectural Registration Boards in 2020, just 0.4% of registered architects in the US were black women. Just pausing on that for a second. Um, so what can we know about the reasons that black women don't choose or end up leaving the architecture profession and how do we turn around this terrible trend? History has to be one of our best guides. Um, surely one important factor is the lack of role models uh, in the historical record. And I often think about this question in relation to my own discipline of English. Uh, Virginia Woolf, as uh, many of you know, famously told an audience of women undergraduates in 1928 that the only way that they could hope to become writers was to learn about women writers of the past. Uh, as Woolf put it, we think back through our mothers if we are women. 
there were vanishingly few canonical women writers Wolf could point to back in 1928, and none of them were Black. The situation in literature may be slightly better now, um, but in architecture, we have to ask how able Black women architects are to think back through their mothers. That is to say, how often is the work of Black women architects included in the curriculum? The erasure of women's and especially black women's contributions to architecture from the historical record has a range of pernicious effects. It renders black women's accomplishments in architecture invisible. It perpetuates the idea that important achievements in architecture are the exclusive preserve of white men. And it hands down to the next generation an inaccurately all white male history. Uh, in the pioneering Women of American Architecture project, we hope to take a more inclusive approach. The archive, which is open for viewing, but still in progress, documents the lives and careers, as I've said, of 50 women architects who made significant contributions to the built environment in the US. Each profile is assembled through primary research, digging through sources to trace the arcs of women architects' careers in the first half of the 20th century. I should say right away that the names of those profiles were selected by a national jury, like any list of 50. It's idiosyncratic, of course, um, not meant to establish the top 50, but rather to offer, uh, we hope, a starting point. And we are still collecting names if people today have more to offer. Before I give you a quick look at the site, I just want to say a word about its biographical approach to architectural history. Now, if you'd asked me when I was a graduate student in Philosophy Hall, if I thought that biography was a useful methodology for feminism, I probably would have laughed or maybe like scoffed is probably more accurate. Such an approach was explained to me, was taught to me as recuperative, reparative history, you know, going to the archives, uncovering the ignored or suppressed work, restoring it to the historical record. I was taught this work was done by our feminist foremothers. It was complete. And uh, further, the methodology was criticized as like add women and stir for failing to destabilize the gendered assumptions that allowed men's works to predominate in the first place and relying on a kind of feminine supplement to correct that imbalance. So I don't dismiss that critique, but I don't feel bound by it uh, at this point. I think that telling stories of women's experiences in the professions does more than add women's names and stir. It also documents and bears witness to the uneven playing field that professional women have had to negotiate forever. Further in the aggregate, it shows how the history of architecture might look a little different when women's work and black women's work is included in the picture. Let me fill in a tiny bit of that story for you. Uh, in having the honor and privilege of working on the archives and the stories and the profiles and pioneering women, we've seen how these architects had to be fearless, resilient, and relentless. Nothing like the solitary figureheads who cast their long shadows over the history of architecture. Ethel Furman, the first black woman architect to practice in Virginia, endured the humiliation of having her construction documents rejected by building officials when she presented them under her own name and having them accepted when submitted under the name of a male colleague. Norma Sklarik was rejected by 19 architecture firms and had to accept work as a draftsperson. Georgia Louise Harris Brown moved from the US to Brazil in search of a place where she could practice architecture without being limited by prejudice, but throughout her career rarely received credit for her own designs. If you spend some time on the Pioneering Women website, one thing you might observe is that a number of the women there are quoted saying something like, I wanna be known as an architect, not as a woman architect. There are exceptions, of course, and you'll hear, I think, today that Beverly Lurian Green was certainly one of them. I'm very much aware that we might be going against these women's intents by collecting their profiles on a site explicitly devoted to women of architecture. I'm also aware that we are doing this because the fact that gender, race, and ethnicity are central reasons why their names are not well known. Can we really leave these categories out of the historical picture when they continue to structure and determine professional outcomes today and to dictate the way that history is recorded? And I hope this is a topic we might come back to in our discussion. So before I close out, I wanna give you just a quick look at the site. So here is our homepage, uh, the, um, which features, as you can see, above all the names of the women architects profiled on the site. 
The list currently includes just about 30 of the 50 and um, we're still in, engaged in writing, editing and posting um, with more to come actually, I think as soon as next week. Uh, the main listing here is alphabetical. The site also offers chronological and pictorial axes. There's also a short introduction to the site, a section for acknowledgement and the list of the many sponsors who've underwritten the project. But of course the main um, object of interest is the profiles. I'll just briefly open one, uh, Roberta's amazing profile of Georgia Louise Harris Brown. Um, you'll see first a picture of the subject when we could get one, which we almost always could, but sometimes they're not great quality. Um, some top line information where the you know, place, place of birth, major projects, education, um, and then a lengthy profile um, beginning with a summary, well illustrated with photographs. I love, love, love this picture, which is why I wanted to show this one um, and so on and so forth. These profiles are intended not just as a corrective to the absence of women in the historical record, but we hope as a means to reach to critique and reshape that record. In bringing together the almost 50 scholars who worked on this project, a few authors, as you can see, wrote more than one. We think we have also assembled one of the largest scholarly groups ever to focus exclusively on women's architecture in the US and to place the work of women and today black women squarely at the center of architectural history. We hope that eventually our 50 profiles can be seen as more than group biography. We hope they can also help us to rethink our notions of how the work of architecture gets done and who does it. Thank you so much. Um, thank you so much. I also just wanted to mention Anat Fabel was the co-editor, uh, uh, the co-writer of um, the Georgia Louise Harris Brown profile. And it was amazing that it took two different nationalities to dig out her rich career uh, with Roberta, Roberta focusing on the early part and um, Anat on the Brazilian half, um, but quite an accomplishment. Um, Roberta, uh, I turn it over to you now uh, to talk about your next profile. Um, so to start, um, I want to say that um, I think that what was just said in terms of how women are placed in history uh, is really important. Um, and of course, it's more important, I think, if you're talking about black women to place them in history. And so what I'm starting off with um, is a look at where um, Louise, I mean, where Beverly Lorraine Green starts um, in history. Uh, and to do that next, Um, and to do that, I did an architectural timeline, uh, but my timeline is, um, I think, related to um, Beverly Green specifically in that um, she's Black and she's female. So if you're Black and you're talking about architecture in uh, the U.S., uh, you have to look at where we come from, where Black folks, Black women came from. And you have to look at what was happening when architecture in, in the US was getting off its feet. And so, you know, if we go back to like 1845, I know that sounds like a far travel distance, but we looked there just to see what was happening in terms of Americans uh, traveling to Paris to study architecture and the creation then of uh, one of the first architectural firms in 1853. And then uh, looking at the American Institute of Architects and when they were created in 1857, and looking at when the Capitol Dome that we discussed this week a lot um, being finished in 1863, next. And then um, things were happening during those times, um, like there was a civil war going on for a lot of the activities that I just described. And that civil war ended in Rome in 1865 making it possible then for black men um, to think about other careers. Women were thinking too, but there was more activity on the side of, of men looking at uh, professions. And how is it that they even got the opportunity to uh, think about architecture? Um, and the, you know, we know what's happened in terms of the uh, reconstruction period, um, a term, a period when 
actually the rights of blacks were held back um, and Jim Crowism started. So some things that could have seemed like really great opportunities at the close of the war in the end didn't quite work out that way. And uh, racism and discrimination, but just all out racism um, became the law of half of the land. Um, but then we know that in 1875, um, Mary Louise Page graduates in architecture from the University of Illinois. And, and about that same time, um, the first uh, black architect is working in Washington DC, Calvin Brent, who was designing churches and homes and he'd never been a slave, which gave him a little head start. He, he lived in DC and he was freed in DC. So he did have a head start, but, but still it was that period when anyone, uh, any uh, black figure came about as, as, a, as an architect and had, could say they had a practice. Um, and we also see that uh, Louise Blanche uh, uh, Bethune grad, uh, started her practice in 1888. And, and then we look at what was happening um, with black architects and see Robert Taylor. Um, and I had to say senior because we're going to also meet another Robert Taylor, his son. Uh, but this Robert Taylor graduates and is the first black um, man to graduate in architecture. Uh, at, from MIT, and that was in 1892. But right after that, uh, George Washington Carver approached him and asked him to come to um, Tuskegee. And at Tuskegee, they worked at starting something that became a school of architecture. At first it was drafting classes and it was based on what Robert Taylor had learned and how he had learned at, at, um, at MIT. And yes, and then we have the first African-American licensed in 1902 in New Jersey. Um, so this is, the, this is the background to um, Beverly Green uh, her career and her uh, and the fact that she had some choices and the fact that she was able to accomplish some of the things that she had to do or that she had to do to become an architect. Uh, but there, so there is a backstory and this is that backstory. Next. And as was mentioned before, there is at least uh, one other woman and I think there are at least three other women who you could say were architects um, before Beverly Green. Um, now, these were, these were women who did architecture, who designed one or two buildings in some cases. In one case, in the first case, the, the Ethel Madis Madison Furman case, uh, is said that she has more than 200 buildings that she designed. And one of her buildings, her first major building was just a house. Her father was a contractor, so I suppose that that helped. Um, but she did a house in 1923. Um, and this was um, a house for the first, it was the house where um, Virginia's first black uh, governor uh, was born. It was his family home. Um, and we also have Elizabeth Carter Brooks, who, um, in 1906 designed this um, home for the aged in, uh, in Bedford, Massachusetts. And in this, in, but she had an opportunity that few, um, few women had and, and that few black people had, and that was to go to a design school, which I think was called oh, Sloan. Uh, but she went to a design school and she learned um, the basics of architecture there. And, and this is one of the results. And, and then the um, third person is Amaze, um, um, Lee Meredith. And she's like the person who was spoken of uh, before, who was described before as, um, um, as a person who is an architect, who was an architect. Uh, her design was a design for a house that she built in Virginia. So there are two, actually, there are two women from Virginia. And, and so we have uh, one 
who did several buildings and was um, considered, if you look in other history books now, as, as Virginia's, one of Virginia's first female architects. Um, but Amaza was amazing in that, um, and she was also a Columbia graduate, um, although she, she graduated from the School of Art. Um, she has a bachelor's and a master's from the teacher, Columbia Teachers College. But she was in New York and she also established a, um, in Long Island, a housing development. She and her, sis her sister and she bought land and they developed it and she designed many of the houses that were placed on the land. Um, and so these three women are, are like what was there, although it's not, it's not like a definite, it's not taken as a definite that Beverly Green actually knew about these people. Um, because as we know, um, very little is written about um, black women who are pioneers in, in, in anything. And, and the little that's written is not usually national. Um, but these women were all written about in their areas and during their times, which is how um, I could find them. And I would like to also say that they each lived for a period in New York. Um, and Ferdman worked for one of New York City's first black architects. And, um, and Brooks um, ran a women's development program in Brooklyn for several years before going back um, to Bedford, Massachusetts. So I think that um, with this backdrop, you can see that there is some history, but like I said, I think it only really helps if you know it. And I don't think that, that it was as well known as it is now, which is still not that great. Next. So this is our subject, Beverly Lorraine Green. Um, and she was the first black woman licensed as an, uh, an architect um, as far as it can be determined. Um, and, um, and she was licensed in 1942. Um, she was born in 1915. Uh, let's go to the next slide. Uh, so she was born in Chicago. Her parents were were from different states and they were part of that um, 1930s migration of black folks to Chicago. Um, now, we don't know enough about um, Beverly to know why she chose um, architecture. You know, she did live in an area um, which was predominantly black and considered, I mean, the, it was called the Black Belt, but it was considered one of the worst areas in Chicago in terms of housing. Um, now that may have inspired her to go to college to study um, architecture. Um, and so in 1932, um, she was accepted and started attending the University of Illinois. Um, and she was um, one of the few black students in her class, but also um, one, there still weren't a lot of women. And this is a, photo, a photograph of um, Beverly and classmates at the University of Illinois um, taken of members of student members of the American Society of Civil Engineers. And um, Beverly is there on the, on the, on the left side uh, with the, a circle, if you can see it um, in the back row, like uh, three people over. Um, but this isn't the only thing she, she joined. She was, she was an outgoing kind of person. She wasn't a, a real um, wallflower flower type. She uh, was interested in meeting people and doing things. And so in addition to belonging to um, this club, she also uh, belonged to the drama club. And one of the things that I um, found or got or was able to get was a letter from a classmate of hers um, who was describing her as, um, well, he described her as mostly quiet, but she knew what she was doing, basically. And I
people about her at that time is also important in understanding uh, what she was all about. Next. Okay, so this is a um, article. This is a cut out um, from a, a, an, an African-American newspaper and it's announcing um, a presentation of a scheme for a housing project. Um, so to, dis to explain how we got here, uh, one of the things that Beverly um, did uh, was to meet other um, black architects and work with other black architects. Um, but she also was interested in um, social development. A group of black architects, including people who were part of the Urban League in Chicago, decided that uh, they should propose a housing plan. Um, now this is, in the end, it, it sort of morphs into what is now, now known as the Ida B. Wells housing um, project. But it started off um, as a presentation from a group of um, black architects and city and civic um, leaders who wanted housing for the South side, which is the side I was describing as where uh, Beverly's family originally lived. Um, and one of the um, main points about um, the, the presentation is that it was before there was a, a Chicago housing authority. And it came about, it seems because um, certain black architects, certain black politicians thought that they had power and thought that they had some, some influence over getting some housing, getting some money for housing. And so this is what they proposed. And at the same time, there were other groups proposing housing, uh, but none of those groups um, um, had proposed at this point. Next. Okay. Um, so there was a, a meeting um, at a party called a party uh, that was organized by um, Robert Taylor Jr. This is the son of the other Robert Taylor who was the first black graduate of MIT. And this was a party, it was called a party in a newspaper, uh, in a social column item in a newspaper. Um, and this party had, uh, was, was supposed to be a party to honor Paul Williams, who was traveling back to California from Washington DC, where he'd been working with Hilliard Johnson. Um, and the reason I'm talking about the party is because it, um, because Beverly uh, Green was one of the um, in attendees, the invitees at the party. And it just shows that even though she was just 22 years old, um, she, she knew what was happening in terms of the world of black architecture or architecture um, uh, altogether. I think she would have known more than, than the average um, um, woman or a black American who was thinking of becoming, uh, or thinking of wanting to become an architect. Um, and the fact that Robert Taylor Jr. Uh, was there to support her and his father having been an architect, he also was an architect, this Robert Taylor, uh, who became eventually the first black commissioner of the Chicago Housing Authority. Uh, he attended Howard before. But at the party, there were people who were um, to be instrumental in providing, um, to be instrumental in making sure that the project that these, this group of people, um, including people at the Urban League and including um, the organizer of the National Technical Association, that all of these people were influential in terms of um, getting more than they thought they could get. And I think it's really like an untold story of how they, they were able to accomplish what they were in terms of uh, getting the housing on the South side, which eventually morphed into the Ida B. Wells housing project. But 
the other point I wanted to make was that um, she had, Beverly had mentors. She had people who were rooting for her. And I think that that also is something that's lacking um, in the lives of other, some other women and some other uh, black you know, young men who may want to be architects and that it helps if you, if you don't have even a mentor, if you know and, and at least have a chance to speak to other folks who are doing what you would like to be doing. Next. And in terms of what Beverly's uh, life was beyond her, her involvement in the housing um, pro pro uh, project, um, she had a full life. <clears throat> One of the things that um, she was most involved in though, uh, was being a part of the AKA, the Delta sorority. Uh, sororities, um, uh, were relatively new and this sorority had been established at Howard University uh, some years, a, a few years before. Um, but she took to this and throughout her entire life, even after she moved to New York, she was very involved with um, the Deltas. And this is um, um, just a, a, mag a, a newspaper clipping showing her at um, a Delta meeting, planning for a Delta event. And the newspapers um, are full of um, articles that name her um, in, in association with different events that uh, the Deltas are, are planning. So she, she had that going for her, and she, but she was also interested in other things. She, working with her mother, um, established a, a girls club, um, which ran um, for a couple of years at least um, in Chicago in the South Side. Um, and she also um, uh, worked with a political group that was raising money uh, to, to buy ambulances to send to Spain during this, their civil war. Um, so she was politically active in addition to um, wanting to um, do architecture and to, and to accomplish um, uh, her goals in architecture. Next. So this is um, a photograph of the Ida B. Wells housing uh, project as it was opening. This was like from opening day. And um, and the result of the, so from the first newspaper article um, that we saw that talked about um, the need for, for housing there and, and the fact that um, in, turn, in addition to the need, there was a group uh, and she was a part of the group it seems that wanted to not only um, have the city um, do a project here, but they also wanted for the, which they wanted for the new, um, uh, for the new housing, Chicago Housing Authority to hire black architects and black drafters. And so it was a two pronged um, fight. And, um, and so it took time and it took uh, a lot more time than they anticipated, but eventually um, the, the new Chicago Housing Authority did place housing, decide to place housing more or less where they, uh, where the original request or plan or suggestion um, said it should be. And so it was there. And then the second part was to make sure that um, black architects and drafters got an opportunity to work on it. And that was um, maybe even more difficult to do. Uh, but um, they were, it, they seem to have been successful. Um, although um, I once uh, did talk to people at the Chicago Housing Authority about, um, about this project and, um, and they have no idea of, of anything that involved um, black architects and drafters. They, they, 
they don't know that. Um, and, and basically, I, I think that the information that I have comes from um, the black press, uh, but it's a story that's told like week after week. So it's not just um, one article and then, you know, we don't hear anything about it for another year. Um, there were um, regular art, um, articles that talked about what was happening. Uh, and it was through reading those articles that I found out about um, the first um, black architect who was being hired to be on a team and, um, but not this team. And later I found out that um, Beverly Green herself was um, selected um, as a person who would be hired as an architect with the title of architect. And it did not specifically say uh, for the Ida B. Wells housing, um, it said, um, you know, that she's, her title will be architect at the Chicago Housing Authority. Um, and during this period or near the, or before she left um, uh, Chicago to come to New York, she um, also um, was listed in the census as a supervisor of a technical center. Um, but there's no more explanation to that. But I think it could be that she um, ran the tech to the um, drafting, a drafting part um, or office that's connected to the Ida B. Wells uh, projects. Um, in addition, um, another, um, I guess, more evidence of why I think that she was much more involved in the development and the design of the project than is normally, that was thought before, is because um, there were several articles about her uh, giving presentations um, to um, um, Black uh, folks from Chicago about what was happening with the Ida B. Wells um, project. She did updates. And at one of the presentations, um, there, it was a presentation for Black women who were looking for careers. And at one of these presentations, she's talking about um, the size of the um, apartments. This is before they're built, uh, how, how much they're going to charge per each size and all of that. But at the end of the article, Beverly Green is making an appeal to other young Black women there uh, to consider architecture as a profession. Um, and, uh, and there are other, um, there's another article about her when she's in New York, where she also talks about architecture as something that black women should um, think about. Okay, next. Okay, so she leaves, she leaves Chicago. Um, and now she did, when she came to New York, um, so one thing I should say about her for a second is that um, Beverly Green, um, had a had a way of making friends who were making friends with people who were connected with newspapers. Uh, when she was in Chicago, uh, there were two social editors, social article editors, who were very close with her and wrote about her. And when she came to New York, um, there were two different art, um, writers for the Amsterdam News who wrote about her. You know. Um, and which is a good thing because that's a source of some material, right? Uh, and not, not everyone um, has that luck. Anyway, so if you look now online, there are many articles, there are just a bunch of articles about Beverly Green um, designing Stuyvesant Town. Um, what is that about? Well, it's not, it's not the truth, but it's based on an article um, that uh, where she gave an interview to Amsterdam News um, that, that was published in uh, Derek Wilson's book. Um, and so what I wrote was that from that article, um, it seemed that Beverly Green moved to New, to New York in 1944 uh, because um, she wanted to work on Stuyvesant Town, which was just a, a bare 
plot of land for as far as you could see, right? Um, but they had apparently advertised in Chicago. And so she decided that she wanted that, um, she wanted the job. She applied for the position. And then she thought she wouldn't get it because um, after she applied, she read somewhere else that um, Stuyver Stuyverson Town was um, announcing that no black people would be allowed to live in Stuyverson Town. So she thought that if no one's going to, if black folks aren't allowed to live there, then certainly they're not going to hire me. But they did hire her and yes, she was the first um, architect hired there. That during that time, though, she had other ideas about um, what she, what else she could do in New York now that she was here, and one of them was to attend Columbia. So she describes how she goes over to Columbia um, during one of her days, her first or second day in New York, and she applies, and um, and then on the third day, she finds out that she's, she's accepted and that she has money to go to Columbia. And so she quits her job. Uh, but online, some people who are telling the story second and third hand, uh, in a certain second or third hand manner, um, just uh, they, they missed the part about she never went back. And so you can see articles that talk about celebrity architect unknown celebrity architect designs Stuyverson Town. So, but she didn't, as you now know. Um, but she um, graduated from Columbia. Um, and so then she had three degrees, right? Because she originally had a, a, a Bachelor of Architecture degree in housing. And then she had a Master's um, of Architecture degree in planning. Uh, but she wanted a master of architecture degree in Columbia, from Columbia, and that's what she got. Um, so her life in New York is pretty different from um, Chicago, but I think that she knew people here because um, just as she was um, um, at a party uh, where she's making, meeting the number one black architect in the country, maybe the world, um, she had connections here too. So she would have known other architects, right? But one of the things that she did was to get involved with CANA, um, which was an organization, Council for the Advancement of the Negro in Architecture, which was an organization um, made up of black and white architects who uh, together wanted to advance um, the, um, the careers and the livelihoods and the possibilities of um, black architects. And so she joined that as most, as many of the, the um, architects, black architects, licensed architects, especially at the time. Um, and she, um, through Canna, met architects who um, she later worked with, it seems. Um, I, I, Isidore um, Rosenfield was um, one of the architects and along with uh, Percy Eiffel who were part of Canna. But those two had been part of another organization before Canna um, that um, basically also had white and black architects working to um, advance and improve the situation of black architects. And she um, did work for Rosenfeld. And I only know because I interviewed someone, uh, the relative of someone else who did, who said that she did. And, and the other little photo there is um, Percy Eiffel, um, who um, was also a, a major player in, in Canada. And Canada is, is the organization also that had um, uh, a major exhibit um, in, um, I, I can't remember the year now, 1950 something, um, which um, was one of the, the first large exhibition of the work of black architects. Um, next. 
And, and these are um, some of the, the guys who I think would have been her mentors, uh, both in Chicago and in New York. Um, Charles Duke, who was uh, an architect and an engineer and the founder of the National Technical Association, worked, would have worked with her, did work with her um, on the Ida B. Wells housing project. And he was very involved in that project from beginning to end. And he's the architect who did the, the uh, drawing and with well, the drawing that I showed, but also all of the floor plans and, and um, all of the um, information that they put together to send to Washington when their group was requesting that um, there be a, build, a, a housing project on the South side. Um, and Roderick um, O'Neill is an architect who um, was um, like the second black architect in Chicago and the first one to have a downtown office, but he, um, hired Louise Harris Brown, um, the previous subject of a, um, a, a write-up that I did uh, that we just looked at before. Um, so he was important to her, and, but I know through other um, interviews that he, um, that Roderick O'Neill um, knew her and talked to her and that they were friends. Although I thought at one point that he had, that she had worked there, but I'm not so sure she did. I just know that they were really good friends and that he was a mentor for her. In New York, she had uh, Conrad Johnson and Percy Eiffel who were partners who had their own uh, business and um, who did a lot of work in, in Harlem, but in other parts of New York too. Um, and um, it was Conrad Johnson uh, who was working at uh, Rosenfield before Rosen, in Rosenfield's office before um, Beverly Green when Beverly Green was um, was hired there. Next, um, in addition um, to Rosenfeld, she uh, Beverly Green also worked for um, Edward Durrell Stone. Um, and although we don't know exactly, exactly what she did, uh, basically we know that there was some work at Sarah Lawrence College and that there was um, some work on a theater um, at the Fine Arts Center um, at the University of Arkansas. Next. And she also worked for Marcel Brewer and um, she worked on the Gross Point Library uh, in Gross Point, Michigan. And um, she also worked on the Winthrop Rockefeller House. And these were projects um, in 49 or 50 that she worked on. Um, and so there's just a sample of her drafting because it's like really rare to find um, evidence of, uh, of an architect's uh, drawing skill or whatever, but to see it is important because it, it, it reinforces that uh, this person, um, at least in some areas, you can say what the person did, right? So we know that she, could, she did that. And there's a letter um, that she wrote in reference to some things um, uh, at Gross Point, at the Gross Point um, Library. And, it, it, and I think that the letter is important because it's, it, it it's all we can, I can only say um, that, she's, that she was at least a drafter, but I don't really know beyond that. Um, but the letter suggests that she uh, was more than a drafter. So I, I think that's important. Next. And, um, and this is um, another project that she worked on the, the UN building in France. And there's a, a little excerpt from a book that mentions her and another woman working in Brewer's office in 1951. And, and the writer is saying that um, it's just really, it's, it's rare to see um, two women, um, well, he's, uh, well, actually it's rare to see two women of any color working in a major architectural firm and having responsibilities. Uh, but he's naming um, Beverly Green, he's mentioning Beverly Green as one of um, these women uh, who has that. Um, next. Um, and um, 
and, and we don't really know all that she did here. And we're not, we can't even say exactly um, what other architectural firms she worked for, but um, we do know that there are two projects that she did some design on, right? Uh, one was a church, was the first floor of a building. Um, and we don't really have much in, the, in terms of what it, what it was in, in terms of drawings, like what is it that was actually done? But we know that these two projects are projects that, that, she, that she did drawings for. And, and the, um, the Unity Funeral Home um, was a building that was completely renovated. It was a, a shell, um, but she did the work to make it a funeral home. And, uh, and she may have done other projects, but um, we don't know that. So we're just going with these two next. And I think then that is, um, those are the high points or the major points that I want to tell you about, uh, about Beverly Lorraine Green. Um, so she died in August of 1957. And, um, and she had um, her memorial service or her funeral was at um, the funeral home that she designed. This is a before picture, but her funeral home was, her funeral was at that place. And so because of that, um, we do know um, some of the things that we know about her because of obituaries that followed. So, um, so that is uh, my uh, story about Beverly Green. Thanks. Thank you so much, Roberta. Um, it's a rich story. Uh, Pat, uh, I turn it over to you to deal with Norma Scolari. Thanks again. Yes, thank you. Thank you so much. I'd like to thank Mary and Victoria for asking me to be part of this project. Uh, it was a real pleasure to work on Norma Merrick Sklarik. Um, and uh, the words pioneering, groundbreaking, and trailblazing are often used in reference to her. Uh, she was even called the uh, Rosa Parks of architecture um, when she was given an award. And this is because she achieved so many firsts. And you'll see, as I go through the, the story, uh, she did, she was the first time and time again. She was not the first woman, uh, black woman architect, however. Uh, and I think that there was something in the Q&A and I think that's been corrected. So as you'll see, she was among the first. Um, she, uh, I would say her intelligence, her talent and tenacity allowed her to overcome racism and sexism and become an incredible architect and leader in the profession. She was born April 15th, 1926 in Harlem. And uh, she was the only child of Walter Merrick, a doctor and Amy Merrick, a seamstress both of whom had migrated from Trinidad. She grew up in Harlem and Brooklyn and attended predominantly white schools, including Hunter High School, a selective public school for girls where she excelled in math and science, but also showed a talent in the fine arts. And this aptitude for math and art prompted her father to suggest a career in architecture. She attended Barnard College for just one year, 1944-45, uh, which was what she needed to, uh, as a prerequisite for admission to the School of Architecture at Columbia. Uh, by her own account, architecture school was difficult. Many of her classmates were veterans of World War II, so they were older. Some had bachelor's or master's degrees already, uh, and they collaborated on assignments, whereas she commuted to school from Brooklyn and struggled to finish her work on the subway or at home alone. As she said later, the competition was keen, but I had a stick to it attitude and never gave up. She graduated from Columbia in 1950 with a BARC, one of only two women and the only African-American in her class. Next slide. And I would just say, I don't have pictures from this early part of her life. Uh, I think um, they, surely exists, but I wasn't able to find them when I did the uh, profile. After graduating from Columbia, Sklarik faced discrimination in her search for work as an architect, applying to and being rejected by 19 firms. As I've already been saying, as she put it, they weren't hiring women or they weren't hiring African-Americans and I didn't know which was working against me. 
So she took a civil service job as a junior drafts person in the city of New York's public Department of Public Works. Uh, according to her former partner, Kate Diamond, Sklarik received the highest score on the civil service test when she applied for this job. And the department was required by law to hire in the order of test scores. So she should have been the first to be hired. To avoid hiring a black woman, however, they postponed all hiring until they were forced by short staffing to offer her a position. Feeling her talents and skills were underused in the city position, she took an architecture licensing exam, the exam, in 1954, passing it on her first try and becoming the first licensed African-American woman architect in the state of New York. After being registered, she worked for a brief time in an architectural firm earning the position despite a bad reference from her supervisor at the Department of Public Works, who resented her. She said, it had to be personal. He was not a licensed architect and I was a young kid. I looked like a teenager and I was black and a licensed architect. And apparently uh, her coworkers also resented her. At her new firm, to her disappointment, she was given menial tasks such as designing bathroom layouts. Next slide. In 1955, Sklarik was offered a position at Skidmore Owens and Merrill. At SOM, she was given more responsibility on increasingly large scale projects. And in fact, she, um, she talks in a number of different memoirs about how her boss really relied on her and said, you do all the hard work, which she, wasn't, she didn't know at the time. In her time at SOM, Sklarik took on highly technical work that more experienced architects could not complete. One of the more extraordinary things about her life is that during this period, she was a single mother of two children, having been married and divorced twice. She was married while, twice while she was at Columbia, in fact. Her <laughs> mother cared for her children while Sklarik worked. In 1959, she became the first American, Af African-American woman member of the American Institute of Architects. So this is where we start to run into the, uh, the, the first after first phenomenon with, with uh, Sklarik. Next slide. In 1960, after five years at SOM, she relocated and took a job at Gruen Associates in Los Angeles, where one of her sons was living. At Gruen, she was aware of extra scrutiny from her supervisor because she was the only black woman in the firm. As a new employee without a car, she took rides to work with a white male colleague who was consistently late. In her words, she said, it took only one week before the boss came and spoke to me about being late. Yet he had not noticed that the young man had been late for two years. My solution was to buy a car since I, the highly visible employee, had to be punctual. In uh, 1962, she became the first black woman licensed as an architect in California. Sklarik rose to the position of Gruen's Director of Architecture, responsible for hiring and overseeing staff architects and coordinating technical aspects of major projects. And I love this image, which I just found. I did, unfortunately, when I was doing the research for the project, for the profile, I did not have this image, but um, I was delighted to see uh, how she's holding the attention of all the white men around her uh, and with such a, a, an ease and such a, a, a look of power. Um, so she was very involved then in a number of really major projects. So next slide, including the California Mart in Los Angeles, 1963, next. Fox Plaza, San Francisco, 1966, next. The iconic San Bernardino City Hall in San Bernardino from 1972-73, next. Uh, the even more famous Pacific Design Center, which she worked on with Cesar Pelli. Next. And the United States Embassy in Tokyo. Next. And here you see her with the drawings for the, um, uh, the Tokyo, the American Embassy in Tokyo. Like many women architects and corporate firms, most of, for most of her career, Sklarik served as a project manager rather than a design architect although she is credited with Cesar Pelli as design architect on the US Embassy in Tokyo. Actually, I guess those are not drawings, those are photos. Um, her collaboration with Pelli resulted in several outlight modern icons, as I've already mentioned, such as the Pacific Design Center and the San Bernardino City Hall. 
Although she was not a design architect, her formidable technical skills and rigorous work ethic made her a brilliant project manager and propelled her to the top uh, position, to a top position in the firm. She stayed at Gruen for 20 years, during which time she married her third husband, uh, Bauhaus trained Rolf Sklarek, an associate at Gruen who died in 1984. And she served on the, the architecture faculty at UCLA and USD. Next. In 1980, Sklarek was the first African-American elected to the College of Fellows of the American Institute of Architects. Uh, in fact, she was the first woman in the Los Angeles AIA chapter to be awarded this honor. That same year, she joined the Los Angeles firm Wells and Beckett Associates as a vice president. And she was responsible, next, uh, for a Terminal One at Los Angeles Airport, this large project that had to be completed before the start of the 1984 Olympic Games, which she was able to do. Her prominence and success made her a role model for younger architects. According to Diamond, Kate Diamond, quote, for Norma to be, the leading, to be leading the entire department of a major architectural practice and doing truly high visibility cutting edge work was something that we all looked to and we all took pleasure from. She was teaching, she was engaged, she was available to young architects, particularly to women and minority architects. Next. Uh, her next professional affiliation broke more barriers when in 1985, she co-founded the women-owned firm Siegel Sklarek Diamond with Kate Diamond, who you see on the right there. Uh, at the time, it was the largest woman-owned architectural firm in the United States, and she was the first African-American woman to co-own an architectural practice. Um, most of their work, however, was small scale and low budget. So after four years, she left uh, the partnership because they were not able to get commissions for large scale projects and she missed the income and the challenges that they brought. So next, she joined Jerdy Partnership as principal of project management where she worked on the Mall of America, which you see here in Minneapolis among many other big projects. She retired from the firm uh, in 1992. During the 90s, she was very involved with public and professional service. She lectured at Howard University, Columbia, elsewhere, mentored young, younger minority and women architects. And this is really important in regards to what, um, what Roberta was saying about Green because Sklarik said she herself had no mentor. Uh, she said, quote, in architecture, I had absolutely no role model. I was happy to be a role model for others that follow. She served on many professional boards and committees. And then in 19, uh, sorry, 2008, next, the AIA awarded, uh, honored her with the Whitney M. Young Junior Award, which recognizes an architect or organization embodying the profession's responsibility to address social issues. And, um, in accepting the Whitney Award, she asserted, quote, I stand here as living proof that no matter what your race or gender, architecture is one field where your hard work, perseverance, and talent can be recognized and rewarded. Sklarik concluded, so don't let anyone try to tell you otherwise. It is with great pleasure and humility that I accept this award. Next. On February 6, 2012, after a lifetime of extraordinary accomplishments and leadership, Sklarik died of heart failure in her home in Pacific Palisades, California. Her legacy, however, continues to garner acknowledgement. In 2013, the, America, the AIA California Council established the Norma Sklarik Award to be, quote, confirmed by the AIA California Council Board of Directors on an architect or an architecturally oriented organization in recognition of their social responsibility. In 2019, she was posthumously awarded the AIA LA or gold medal by the AIA Los Angeles chapter. Most notably for future scholarship on Sklarik, Michelle Joan Wilkinson, the curator of architecture and design at the National Museum of African American History and Culture has established the Norma Merrick Sklarik archive at the museum. And some of these images come from, um, some, uh, from, from that archive. And this is very exciting. I had no archive when I worked on the profile. In a keynote address at a 2019 Princeton University event, Norma Merrick Sklarik, Redefining Public, 
Wilkinson quoted a 1975 letter that Sklarik had written to the vice chancellor at LA, UCLA, where she was a faculty member. Quote, as far as I know, I am the first and only black woman architect licensed in California. I am not proud to be a unique statistic, but embarrassed by our system, which has caused my dubious distinction. This letter demonstrates her sharp cognizance of the inequities embedded in the profession and her efforts to counter them. As a practitioner and a mentor, Sklarik broke ground knowing she faced long odds as a black woman architect, but nevertheless, she persisted, thrived and built community in spite of the anti-black racism and structural sexism of the profession. She continues to serve as an exemplar and to gain recognition for her remarkable accomplishments. Thank you. Thank you, Pat. And thank you again, Roberta. I think we have uh, just a rich image of two very strong, um, impressive women. Um, I want to open it up soon because of the hour to uh, the audience, but I mentioned to both Roberta and Pat um, three issues that I thought they might want to respond to, although they've addressed them to an extent in their talk. Um, the first one was research. You heard uh, the challenges of working on architects where there are no arc official archives. It's great to hear that Scalaric now has one. Um, and uh, the particular challenges they had uh, on it, perhaps anything else you wanna comment about that? I noticed Roberta said black newspapers, mentioned interviews, um, any other kind of advice, especially to the students in the audience doing research who, you know, the first thing we usually do is just go to some public archive. What do you do when you don't have it? Um, I think that, um, what you just mentioned, it, it is like looking up going, it is going and looking uh, through library files, black libraries primarily. I would think usually have files on whoever is considered important black folks. And so that's a start. I spent a lot of time at the Schomburg um, in the beginning, mm -hmm. um, not just because they, I thought they had files, but they have, they, in those days they had card catalogs but they have um, access to information from other um, or various black newspapers and magazines and uh, who's who uh, in black America. And so those things were all helpful. And that's what I sort of depended on. But it's really good when you have a subject like Beverly Green, who newspaper um, writers, feature I, uh, writers liked to write about. You know, um, there, I, I found an article that someone wrote about her um, going to um, a tennis match, right? With uh, the, the, I've forgotten her name, the woman who was the uh, first black uh, uh, champion in terms of, of tennis in New York. And she, and so, but she's listed in the article of people who, about people who went to the, to the match, like that's weird, you know? So sometimes you're lucky and, and you get someone who everybody writes about, but there are cases where no one is writing about. Yeah, it was much more like that with the case of Norma Sklarik that uh, she was, you know, actually more covered in her early years by papers like the, um, the New York Age. Uh, that was invaluable because there were all these little social tidbits and I am so grateful that those newspapers are, are, are online now, have been digitized because they're an incredibly rich resource. And I totally agree with Roberta. You really have to look at the black, black press, black libraries. That's, that's where you find the, the material. Um, honestly, there was so much misinformation about Scleric that I had to really sort through as many sources as I could find. Uh, uh, the Wikipedia entry was mostly wrong um, you know so it's just like uh, just almost counter counter information as well um, but yeah the, there was a, also there's an audio file with an interview with her that was very helpful although she's kind of non-committal about a lot of things but still every little piece of evidence I would have to make sure I had another source because people got things wrong in interviews and 
It was really interesting. Very, very difficult research. I, I was even struck how we had trouble uh, trying to correct the spelling of uh, Beverly Lorraine, uh, uh, Lorraine Green um, because everybody spelled it once because of a typo with one R. And I even when I corrected it on Wikipedia just the other day, I got a mean email saying, what's your source? And I, 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 I said, you know, the Columbia Records and the World Scholar on her assure me that it's two R's and it was a misprint. I don't know what the Wikipedia image says now, but, um, but there are these just sort, I, th I think the kind of what I so appreciate about both of your research and, and the research going on more broadly now is this attempt to get beyond the same little few lines that show up online. Um, and I think that's good advice. Um, I also just, what didn't show up maybe in these two was the need for even personal uh, material. Um, maybe Roberta, you, I don't know how much you wanna mention, but you you found um, got personal memoirs in one case when you were working on an architect. And I think that too uh, is a, a, you know, a source. Yeah, um, and, uh, and that came about because um, I, I, I had heard, this was in the case of um, Louise Harris Brown. Yeah. I had heard that um, uh, there, you know, there, there was this architect and that she had lived and I could not find her. I could not find anything about her. And I, um, I did everything I could. This was just when the internet was becoming a thing, but before I knew what that thing was, but I had a friend who said, I can, I can, I can help you. I can find it. Uh, and, and so his thing, his thing was to put in, um, her name, um, uh, Georgia uh, Harris uh, Brown, and just wait for a hit. And for a year, uh, we waited. And then he called me one day and said, I have it. <laughs> you know, I have something. I have good news and I have bad news. And the good news was that he had a hit. He knew something, something had been printed, something was on the internet about her. And the bad news is that it was her obituary. Uh, but I used that as a start and I interviewed um, her relatives who were listed in the obituary. Mm -hmm. And from there, I met um, her son who had a trunk full of, of um, her letters, had her diary, um, had uh, all of her uh, cards and her, her um registration card. So it was, it was just, but it was, I don't want to say it was luck because it had to, it only happened because she died, but it was um, a source, um, a close to true source of, of information about someone that normally I could, I would never know those things. And, and, it, and she happened to be a person who wrote letters. <laughs> so, and so that helped too. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, we have, I mean, even finding obituaries for some of the figures has been a challenge and having to go to obscure sources like Elizabeth Mock, who you, a woman and not black, mm -hmm. you would think as a curator of MoMA, she might appear in the New York press. We had to go to Princeton Tom Topics to find an interview and some citation on Taliesin. So I think um, obituaries are a source, but even those you have to go to other presses, yeah? yeah. yeah. Victoria, because you have to tune out, leave soon. Before I ask about my other questions, do you have some questions you wanna to pose to the speakers or points you wanna bring up? Well, I'm just, you know, um, I know these stories so well, but I just am so struck by the coincidence really, maybe it's a coincidence that the two subjects we're talking about today we're both so eager to put themselves out there as available role models for the next generation of young black women. And you know, with Beverly um, in particular saying, architecture is a great career for like, like literally recruiting. Mm -hmm. um, and um, so many of the other women we've profiled in Pioneering Women 
explicitly don't say that. They don't want to be known as women architects. They find it like uh, belittling to them as professionals. Mm -hmm. And I wonder if you just have any comments on that disparity, which I find so striking. Well, I, I think that in the case of uh, Beverly Green, um, she, she, I think she thought that her life could have been better if she had a mentor. And so she, because of that, that was, I think that was her reason or her motivation behind uh, wanting to do something different. But I also think that it has to do with a person's personality. <laughs> Mm -hmm. And um, not everyone's personality is outgoing and, you know, talking, whatever. Uh, in the case of Georgia uh, Brown, Georgia Louisa Brown, uh, she didn't uh, want to talk about any of it. She didn't talk publicly. She didn't, she didn't want to be anybody's mentor. And she had that attitude that you, or you were just describing as wanting to make sure that, you know, no one saw her as a mentor for black women because she only wanted to think of herself as an architect. So if you want to talk about it that way, yes. But she clearly, from her writing, did not um, appreciate, uh, you know, um, ideas, people referring to her as a mentor. Yeah. It's a heavy categorical burden to be asked to sort of represent. Yeah. Um, yeah. And I think that's one of the unusual things about Norma Sklarik, that she, um, she not only, you know, put the words into action, but she, the letter that, that Michelle Wilkinson found, uh, really going to uh, bat for her students and, and advocating for them and positioning herself, in fact, as the first and perhaps only Woman, black, black woman architect in California. I think that that is, that's exactly why then the AI honored her for the, uh, for her activism. But it is really, I think, quite a, a, unusual to both be able to be successful in the profession and then also foreground your marginality. Um, so uh, she was very strong character and very outgoing, I gather. But one of the other things that um, you, I don't think you mentioned is that um, Norma was like, selected by her peers to be a, a mentor. I mean, she didn't have yeah. to, I mean, even if she wanted to, but even if she hadn't wanted to, she still would have been. And, and uh, that first, um, there were um, two or three conferences um, in the eight, early eighties uh, mm -hmm. about black women by, about by and for black women in architecture. And at the first one at Howard, um, in 82 or 83, uh, she was the star. <laughs> mm -hmm. yes. uh, um, and she was uh, someone who uh, everyone, uh, so it was, you saw a room full of uh, black women, uh, different levels in terms of their architectural career, but um, mm. we all like bow down. <laughs> <laughs> she had that, she had that force, yeah. yes. Fantastic. It's yeah. great. Well, I added to the lot of things out, but yeah. Anyway, it's it's great to hear this. I I have more questions, but I saw some good questions in the chat, so I'll I'll read them, um, and uh, then maybe turn to some others as well. David Rifkin, also an alum, uh, asks. Um, he was in our doctoral program and now uh, teaching in Miami. Did Green and Scalaric make a point of working with black consultants, such as landscape architects and engineers? And did they promote the careers of black building contractors? Any knowledge or? Yes, I think for Green, um, I know that um, the project that I described, the Ida B. Wells housing project, oh. that she and other black architects um, and engineers, um, worked on in, in that project, working on that project, they not only um, promoted themselves, but they promoted black contractors and, they, and, and the newspapers um, are full of articles about the fights that they had with the city over not hiring, uh, who didn't want to hire the black superintendent. Uh, they would use the firm, but they didn't want the superintendent. And I think that those are the kinds of battles that, um, yeah, that they had and they fought, but not, but that's not uh, always common. It's not always, in New York, when she worked in New York, uh, Beverly Green didn't have any, she didn't, she didn't 
have choices. I mean, she works on two small projects that we know of, but when she worked for larger companies, she had no input as far as I can tell on the selection of engineers or contractors or any of that. So it depends on um, what, your, what your strength is, I guess. And Pat? Yeah. I, you know? I don't know. Yeah, I, I don't know if she um, used consultants or, or contractors, but I do know that she, um, she hired very diversely uh, because she uh, uh, grew and she was really the person doing the hiring uh, within the firm. And I know that she hired a uh, number of people who I've had con correspondence with. Um, so she was very explicitly diversifying the firm. As to whether she has used black contractors, I don't know. I don't know that she had that kind of control. Yeah, that's helpful. Um, I have a, thank you both. I have a, another question from another Columbia graduate, Kate Regev. Thank, first, thanking both of you. Um, and she asks, as she writes, it's interesting that both women, along with several other black architects attended Columbia. Do we think that this is because the school was perhaps more open compared to other schools? or because it was in New York, which was such a diverse city, uh, is a diverse city. Um, any thoughts about that? I have a few. Let's <laughs> see <laughs> Yeah, I, I think that it was for, for Norma Sklarik, I think it really was about being in New York. Uh, this, is the, this is the architecture school in New York where she was. Um, and I think, yeah. And I'd be interested to hear your thoughts, Mary. Well, and, first, Roberta. <laughs> well, for uh, Beverly Green, I agree. I yeah. think she also, um, uh, it was New York first and then Columbia, you know? And I think mm -hmm. that that's the choice of many architects so because I, I've, um, I've researched um, a, a great a number, large number of black architects who came to New York for whatever reason, but went to Columbia. Some went to Pratt, some went to Pratt and then Columbia. Uh, mm -hmm. But um, I think that that was uh, sort of like, if you're here and if you can get in, that's the place to. That's a good answer. I was actually thinking, Roberta, maybe you want to talk more personally about your own situation. One thing in my much later period, um, coming to teach at Columbia in 78, I would say the point we made earlier about mentors was all critical in that period. Because when I came, um, not only were people like Max Bond teaching, but there was John James, Elaine Her Hermanus, uh, there were black faculty. And then Max was cha chair of the architecture department. We had a chair at that point. And Jim Polshek, the dean, was very committed. And I think Amal is following his, in that much, is very much in the same vein, to increasing uh, numbers. Uh, we all knew there was a moment when Roberta went to school, when there was a, large per a larger percentage of black students. But I think there was a commitment to having at least represent the national percentage and specific scholarship money was raised. And we had quite a few black students in the early eighties relative to what we had in the nineties and first part of the 21st century. And really until the last five years, few years or so. And I don't know quite what that was, if it had to do with issues of um, urbanism, if it had to do with um, other concerns, but I can't help but think that the presence of so many black faculty and especially Max Bond uh, wasn't important then. But maybe there are others who have thoughts on that too. Or but I think that the period that you're describing, that period when I went to um, Columbia uh, that uh, Sharon Sutton writes about in her yeah. book, um, that period is um, atypical. I mean, it's not. Yeah, it uh, is atypical. Uh, and, and when mm -hmm. I went to Columbia, um, I, I did not know before I went to Columbia that what was happening there was happening. Um, I had no idea there was a program to recruit uh, because I wasn't recruited. I, I was working in Chicago. No, no, I was working in Detroit then. And um, I was working um, 
for a company doing hospital design and someone there, uh, actually their only black associate there, uh, suggested that if I really wanted to get ahead, if I wanted to do hospitals and get ahead, I would mm. study it. And I was like, you mean you can do that? <laughs> yes, he said, you can study hospital design. People have been doing that for years. Um, and, he, and he and this architect suggested, Roger Modrum actually, uh, suggested uh, Columbia. And so I wrote to Columbia and asked if I could um, ask for a, a, an application and then turned it in. And I did not really, I wasn't, I was like really surprised that it was that easy. I, when I got to Columbia, I found that there was a whole different thing, but I didn't know that that was different. I thought that that's how it was. When I, when I got to Columbia, Max was there and, and the school was full of black folks <laughs> it was, and there were black teachers and black people in charge and all over. And it was so, I just took it for granted that that was Columbia. Then mm -hmm. like about five or six years later, when I went back to do, I was doing a talk at Columbia, um, I realized that there were no black, there were no black students. Um, <laughs> there were no, uh, black professors, and I mean, maybe there was one, I don't know, I never saw any, um, but it was just, um, and so that time was a very particular time caused by a particular urgency and program that um, both um, uh, some students and some faculty had, but it's, it's, and that's why it's good to have a book about it, because that ceased to exist um, after six or seven years from the time I was there. Um, and so then it was like just a regular school with um, very few Almost. black students and no black faculty. And that's what it was most of the time after that I remember. Yeah. I, I think it's a kind of reminder too of how do you sustain these changes and not just react to particular events like in the case of your generation, Roberta, it was 68. Mm. and the protests, and maybe even now we're very conscious given recent events, but how do we sustain it when those things begin to seem like past history um, in a field? We have some more questions. Let me read one more. Um, someone asked Alvin Brown uh, if Scala whether he writes, can it be that Scalaric had an immigrant background and Oh, well, he was wondering if this may have shaped her views. Yeah, I think I think so. I, I think that um, her family had, uh, with, by all accounts, were really quite extraordinary. Very, very supportive. She had a very close relationship to her father, in particular, and um, there does seem to be some relationship there uh, between. And I think the question was asking about mentorship. I think she herself had been so, but well supported that uh, in many ways then building community and kind of paying back came very naturally to her. Uh, that's, that's by her own account. That's how she really presents her early life and then uh, and how she felt that she could you know, further, further this mentorship uh, in, in the prof her professional and, and community work, so yeah. Okay, um, one more question uh, that came in from Abigail Sachs, another author on the website, thanking you first for your great presentations. And then um, she writes, Patricia's comment that Scalaric was not identified as a designer is actually an opportunity to widen our understanding of architecture um, as a profession, um, to include a wide range of active professionals and, and Maybe you want to comment on that. I think that was, as Victoria mentioned, one of our real goals on the website uh, was to think of the profession in a broader sense. Um, well, and you had asked, um, or sort of posed the question to us about intersectionality. Um, yeah. So I was thinking about that and I found a quote, um, which I, I took out of the, um, the presentation, but um, it was uh, Marshall Purnell, who was a former president of the AIA. And I this may have been in fact when, well, I'm, I'm not gonna be able to quote, uh, pin down the, the source, but um, he said that she was more than capable of designing large projects, but, and this is his quote, it was unheard of to have an African-American female who was registered as an architect. 
you didn't trot that person out in front of your clients and say, this is the person designing your project. And I was shocked by his frankness, uh, but that I think really does point to the degree to which there's the intersection of race and gender very clearly uh, that were operating throughout her career. And so even though she was really a brilliant architect, uh, Kate Diamond says she could think three-dimensionally like no one else that uh, Kate had ever met. Net. Nevertheless, her gender and her race disqualified her from becoming a front-facing member of the, uh, of the team. Sorry, cat is. <laughs> And, and Roberta, maybe you want to comment on that too. If someone met, mentioned in the uh, Q and A, um, it seemed like in some of those photos, not only are there very few black architects, there are very few women. Um, how do you feel? You know, we tend to put these things in silos in architectural history: women in architecture, black architects. Um, and one of the things that's amazing about your work to me is that you really bring them together and, and other people as well, like Mario Gooden does in his recent book when he talks about uh, Amazingly Meredith. Um, any thoughts on this about, can we even pinpoint what part of their uh, struggles have to do with being a woman or being black or... Um, yeah. Uh, 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 I find it difficult uh, to pinpoint. Um, and it's very rare that when I was um, like working for other companies and, and trying to work my way up before I got licensed and after I got licensed, but it was very rare uh, to understand sometimes why something happened if it was because you were black. Occasionally you would know, but, but mostly you couldn't tell because women were, in the beginning anyway, as disadvantaged as black folks. So if something happened to me or had something um, um, could have been seen as maybe uh, racism, I'd have to remember, oh, but I'm, I'm a woman too. So who knows, <laughs> you know, um, and it doesn't even, it, it doesn't even, um, it's not even worth the time to try to figure out which it is because um, that's just time wasted. But I think the thing is to just figure out, just decide to go ahead and to push ahead and to do what it is that you think you can do. Uh, but, um, and I, I, there was one article where Beverly Green was um, saying that she had gone for um, an interview. Yes, this was Beverly Green who said she had gone for an interview, but she couldn't tell um, if she did not get a job because it was because of sex or if it was because of, of race, you know? And she thought sometimes it was mainly uh, because of sex, you know, of, because she was female and that they could have accepted her possibly in some firms if she were a male, right? Uh, even if she were black, but, yeah. but it's hard to tell. You know, all you know is that if you got, you know, two strikes against you, you have to fight in both lanes. Yeah. You can't just mm -hmm. work it I, well, I, I think we do. And I think, you know, there probably is, which I think you kind of alluded to, Roberta, there's been a change since second wave feminism. Um, and per perhaps let's just hope that the events of the last couple of years also mean a change um, and status uh, of black architects and numbers. I mean, I think we're really struggling with that. Um, look, it's been a very rich discussion. I think some people are very hungry and ready for their lunch or they have a studio projects to go on to. I can't thank you enough. And um, I hope too, uh, we will continue these discussions in other venues and other places. So. Thanks very much, um, and thanks, thanks to the audience. Too. Yes, thank you so much. This has been a lovely discussion, really terrific. And yes, to be continued, for sure. Yes. Bye-bye. <laughs> thank yes. you, bye-bye. Bye-bye.